This is Dr. Joshua Mayich. Um, he's a, uh, ortho a, a surgeon who just informed me that uh, he's not going to be a surgeon anymore. He's going to be a full-time hop grower. So that's pretty cool. Um, this came about with, uh, we've really been working hard to uh, work with the BC Hop Growers Association and their board. Um, it's obviously instrumental for us to uh, support as much as possible um, the, the hop growing industry here. Um, there's lots of things that we have talked about that we need to do. Education on both sides of our parts to uh, let people know that we are a hop growing area. We want to use local hops. Um, uh, the, the brewers. There is some, as you guys know, some contract issues and things like that. We're trying to work through that. Um, but the Hop Growers Association has been super pro proactive with us, and I think uh, it's a relationship that uh, I'm looking really forward to to continue to grow. Um, part of uh, the, the ability to have Joshua come out here was um, working with the, the Hop Growers Association, worked with the uh, Provincial Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, Rajiv Dosanj is with us today. We were really uh, great and happy that he could join us. Um, we have a really close relationship, the craft brewers do, with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. They've been exceptionally supportive to us over the years. They've done long-term studies for us. Um, it was actually uh, one of the uh, deputy ministers who said to me four years ago, you know that tourism thing you're always telling everybody about that you want to do, world-class beer tourism? Well, I hear Destination BC's change the way they do the business. You need to talk to this woman, Kim Hood, right now. And we literally got into the office. I think we might have been one of the first people through. So the BC Ale Trail exists, honestly, because of the work that the Ministry of Agriculture did. But you're not here to hear that. We're here to hear uh, from Josh. He has come from uh, Darling Farms. Um, which is a family-owned and operated hop farm that produces high-quality hops with a focus on aroma hops. Darling Island Farms is committed to evidence-based and community-focused farming, research and development, industry-related expertise, as well as nurturing close relationships with the brewing community. Oh, that page. That's, I never liked the page break. And sorry. <laughs> farm to grow carefully while maintaining committed excellence at every step. That was worth the wait, wasn't it? The fumbling and the bumbling. Uh, so Joshua, take it away. Not many people clap when they find out I'm stopping surgery to do this. I appreciate the support. Um, so to start, I've been asked... Uh, to announce the winner of the Loopy Link Cup. This is a super awesome initiative pushing hop growers to be better. Um, and um, this year, it was it was a close, very close race, but it was ultimately won by uh, Braden Hof uh, Hop Farms uh, with their Comet. So congratulations to Ray. Now it is time for me to bore you for the next 45 minutes. Um, to start, I'll thank everybody. Um, this is an amazing event. We do not have anything like this in the Maritimes. Um, it's a huge uh, honor to be invited. Uh, Ken is a great host. Um, uh, and the best part about this is getting to talk with people um, and share ideas. Um, thanks for the donated booze. Um, and my wife and kids who tolerate my insanity. Um, but above all, don't hesitate. I'd love to speak with everyone, and I'm from Cape Breton, so if you poke me the wrong way, I won't shut up for hours. So seriously, talk to me. Um, so I own my conflicts of interest. I don't grow any proprietary hops, so we'll start with that, and you'll see where this goes. Um, I'm a certified sister, and I do a bunch of other stuff, and I have other conflicts that'll affect how I see the world. Um, the, the study I'm talking about is in the technical quarterly coming up, the special hop issue. So if there's something you're interested in or want to look at it for those MBAA members, it'll be published there coming up shortly. We're going to talk about hops, why they are the way they are, why it's super challenging to um, farm them. We're going to learn from my indoctrination in the Canadian Army and how that can help, help us be better at what we do. We're going to talk about... Um, 
about beer drinkers and why they drink beer, why they choose the beer that they choose, and how we can exploit that information to be better brewers and ultimately better hop farmers. Uh, and we're going to talk about being um, Canadian and how that's great, um, and why Mar the Maritimes is better than British Columbia. <laughs> but while I'm really here, if you got free liquor, I'll do it, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so problems. Um, we're going to look at this as large farm versus small farm. Um, large farms have a lot of stuff. They have um, a lot of money, a lot of capital, and a lot of the stuff that you need to be able to uh, develop breeding programs and all this stuff that creates unique, cool, trendy hops. Small farms have very few of these things, um, and small being less than, um, let's call it less than 500 acres. Um, um, but we don't have no, we don't have any ability, like no ability. And so the idea is that to be a small to medium sized hop farmer, you got to be a little bit of a, of this dude, <laughs> um, willing to kind of take things on and take risk and do all that stuff. But you're craft brewers, so you know what that feels like, right? Seriously. Um, we're a lot more similar than we are different for sure. But the reality is, is that um, brewers don't, don't buy the beer, right? Beer drinkers buy the beer. Um, and the ultimate say as to what's needed or where the industry is headed is determined at the taps and at checkouts of liquor stores, or in the case of New Brunswick, off the back of Buddy's truck, um, and not necessarily in the brew house. So when you're doing business planning, farther as a hop grower or as a brewer, um, what you're looking for in the long term is what the public wants, right? Because what the public wants is what we need to give them. Um, and so the idea, and there's a lot of things that hop growers look at in the short term, and that's really where a lot of growers are focused. Um, but the idea is to look long term, and all the long term goals turn into what, are the, what does the public want, what are the trends in beer consumption as determined by the beer drinking public, and what does the data predict um, the coming trends are going to be, and all these things are available. Um, but for us hop growers, um, a lot of the key questions are, are listed here. And so um, what prices can the local market sustain? What varieties are in demand now? What varieties are falling out of favor, or becoming less economically viable? Um, what are coming up? And, what, and then practically, what public varieties are available? What's that? Closer? OK. Mostly people are telling me to talk quieter. Shut up. This is great. Um, <laughs> If you look at the past seven years of my life, this is what it's been. So finding out what hops grow well, because these are all non-native hops, with one notable exception. Um, um, and with the example of Zotzer in New Brunswick, Canada, um, we need to know what's resistant, um, what the reaction of the plants are to the local pest and disease pressure, um, and how does the plant produce uh, with respect to the local, local conditions, so climate, uh, soil, that sort of stuff. Hops are a super crazy awesome plant. Uh, they're also terrifying. Um, they have a very, very large genome for, for a plant. There's a lot of genes there. Um, and you're looking at 76% of the size of the human genome. So that's a lot of genes for a plant, which means that they're highly adaptive. There's a lot of uh, genetic information to lean on. And so for that reason, the plants tend to be responsive to environmental cues. For those of us military people, I always look at the world in a very narrow way. The genome or the DNA is kind of like the Pentagon, or in, in our case, in Ottawa. And the defense mechanisms that are deployed by the genome are kind of like idiots like me going around with stuff like that. Um, and in the hops, it's like oils, acids, growth, productivity, all of these things, or what the plant modifies based on the information it gets from the genome. The bottom line is farming them is not easy. Um, at Darlings Island Farm, we have documented <clears throat> changes in the major constituents to temperature. By that, absolute temperature, our temperature trends over different periods of time, pest presence across four pests, disease presence, timing of pest and disease presence, total burden of pest and disease presence, rainfall time, and overall absolute amount. So, and these are just some of them that we're kind of balancing while we're growing um, so that the um, New Brunswick Sots are as an alpha acid of 6.2 and not 6.5. Um, 
But the idea behind this is trying to get information that's useful and trying to find ways to harness this to our benefit so that as a grower we can produce more readily available, uh, or sorry, uh, consistent product. Um, and for those of us who were raised in uh, a Germanic military family, um, the idea is that you don't have to be mindless about it. And a concept I learned in the Army is operational responsiveness. And this is a big term. But what it basically means is that the, uh, the ability to respond to changing conditions, and in our case, customer interactions, and as they occur. So in the Army, you would never go anywhere where you can't get out of. That was kind of a basic principle. And the idea is you had to have things set aside so that when you went in and, and found things, so intelligence would find something you weren't expecting, or um, a reconnaissance mission would find things you weren't expecting, that you had ability to adapt to that environment. So the adapt and overcome is kind of the classic things. And basically what operational responsiveness is, um, is based on a few different key factors. So knowing what your goals are. So what are you trying to do? Um, and how do you think you need to get there? The second thing is, is information, right? You need to be collecting information. And for, a grower, um, for growers, we collect information. For brewers, um, you guys are also collecting information like sales or um, um, other sorts of uh, parameters and metrics that are important to your business. And the idea is, is you're asking like, what's happening? How, how, how are things going? Um, is this anticipated? Is it not anticipated? And then the idea of the willingness to embrace change to achieve your goals. And finding the things that you need to care about or not care about and using that information to get at the desired result. The classic example is McDonald's coffee. I don't think anybody here drank McDonald's coffee 10 years ago. No one, right? It was disgusting. Um, uh, and, but as it turns out, a lot of people are drinking McDonald's coffee now. So why would McDonald's do that? <laughs> There's lots of good reasons. McDonald's coffee was not palpable. Uh, palatable, sorry. Um, and that is a serious image problem. So this is a, um, a political cartoon in a prominent uh, American newspaper around that time. So then McDonald's started doing some research and they realized, holy crap, when people choose to buy their coffee, they also tend to buy food. So we're not selling coffee, we're selling uh, a sausage and egg McMuffin. So the idea is that by doing research to figure out why aren't people buying McDonald's coffee, they realize that not only can they sell more coffee, but they can sell a whole bunch of other stuff at the same time. So this is a great example of operational um, responsiveness. McDonald's is like, we're not selling coffee. Why aren't we selling coffee? Turns out you dig into it. Not only can we sell a whole bunch of coffee, but we can sell a whole bunch of other stuff. Operational responsiveness in a hop yard looks a lot like this, right? So you have the two rows of nugget on either side. Um, and in the central row, you've got comet, right? Um, and that idea is the, the changing trends in which hops are wanted, which hops are not wanted, um, and having the ability to respond to that. Obviously, hop growers, we, operational responsiveness is a huge issue, right? Because our turnaround is five years, minimum, depending on which variety, depending on where you are. A place like BC is definitely, I do admit it, a little bit better than the Maritimes, because um, you have at least some data to fall back on. Where I'm at, I'm it. So as far as creating data goes, I'm not the only hop farmer by any stretch, but as far as generating data, I'm it. So at the end of the day, um, you can be a little sure, sure of your decisions, but this is why doing market research and, and marketing directly to drinkers, not that studying you guys isn't something I also do, but um, studying drinkers directly is important. You want to see operator, operational responsiveness in hop farming, here it is, right? So 2014, not a whole lot of citra going on, right? And then look at 2018 and citra overtook Cascade. Um, what you're seeing here is operational responsiveness, right? Growers responding to demand and doing so in an incremental fashion. Look at the citra curve. It's like pretty predictable. Um, at every year, they're reevaluating re and reevaluating and moving three years in advance. So the decision for 2017 was made in 2014. So which can be good or bad, 
right? Because with hops, you're kind of strapped to a rocket, right? It's already going. You've already planted the plants, and now you're waiting. And so the idea is, you know, if everyone decided that the cat piss thing is something they can't tolerate, then you're screwed. <laughs> because <laughs> you've already planted 6,000 you know, 6, pounds worth in 2015. You're already strapped to the rocket, like you're getting it one way or the other. So at the end of the day, you just kind of chill out. And this is where research comes in handy, why continuing research is so important, right? To operational responsiveness, getting the information is the most important thing. Which is why in the military, the recce guys are the ones who treat the best, right? They come in, they get the seat they want. <laughs> you want some extra, extra steak, go for it, you know, because they're the ones that are keeping everyone else, and keeping everyone else safe. Um, so where are we now? On Darling's Island Farm, we know it grows well. Um, it's been seven years of research and, um, and investment and a lot of capital investment. We know what's sustainable and profitable. We know how to do it, um, inorganically, inorganically, Sam. Um, we know which varieties produce uh, and what they produce. But at the end of the day, there's a couple of key questions. What do drinkers actually want? Yeah, when they go and drink the beer, what kind of beer are they reaching for? Is it just Moosehead, or are they willing to drink other stuff? Um, and are we able to provide that? So I don't have the option of growing um, Simcoe. Am I going to be able to get, get you guys what you need, the flavor constituents in the beer that you guys need um, to be able to do what you need to do to keep customers buying your beer? This is the creepiest picture on the internet. It's a stock photo, and I just laughed my ass off <laughs> that some company <laughs> posted this as a stock photo. Anyway, it's a woman choosing what kind of beer she wants in the super creepiest way ever. But anyway, um, I laughed my whole life when I saw it. It's so funny. Um, but you need to know, right? You need to know what people want. You need to know where people are going with it. Like, are people wanting more beers like New England IPAs? Is that trend dying? Is it going to stay for a long time? Are we going back to lagers forever? What kind of lagers do people want? What kind of flavors do they want? Are they willing to tolerate versus what flavors are they willing to, to pay a price for? Is this more a high value market where people want to buy, they want to buy their moose head for 90% of their beer and just want the 10% to be a very high value product? Are you missing it with a mid value product? All these super critical questions um, are the ones that are going to, at the end of the day, kind of dominate um, the decision making. And as a hop grower, we have to be able to respond to those needs um, and do that effectively with reasonable turnaround. Note I said reasonable. Any questions about any of that stuff? Perfect. So for the next little bit, we're going to talk about what flavors people are after, what styles, and what format. So the flavors. And this is where um, a Cicerone like me gets really obsessive about stuff. Um, so the, the, the trial that we conducted was on um, roughly 400 um, uh, self-identified beer drinkers. Um, and they basically reported on the pleasantness and the likelihood of purchasing behavior based on beer flavor. Um, and we used a seven-point grading scale, which is a standard. So basically, overall, shocking. Stone fruit, citrus, and berry. Those are the three flavors everyone likes. Those are the three flavors everyone wants. They are in a group of their own and statistically different from the rest. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, right? No. Um, honorable mentions um, are melon, spicy, and woody. Um, and we're going to get into why those are there the way that they are. The gender differences here are significant, and they're across apple, pear, stone fruit, and berry. Um, males uh, tended towards malt forward or malt centric flavors, while females tended towards uh, fruited flavors. So, apple, stone fruit, berry, and pear. And those differences are significant, both statistically and when you look at the raw numbers. Those are significant differences across those groups. But everyone at the end of the day wants stone fruit, citrus, and berry. And again, these three above the rest and in a significant way. So you can group them that way. And what is it that women want with respect to hops? Of the hop-derived flavors, um, the addition of apple and pear is significant. And again, um, although as a, as a secondary group, are an important secondary group for those people in, in, um, in beer choice. Um, 
And this had price advantage. So beers with these women were mo willing to pay more for, which was an interesting finding. Not surprising what men want, not that. Um, um, spicy, earthy, or woody um, flavors uh, were statistically more um, significantly driven in, in, in males for beer purchasing behavior. But at the end of the day, you've got a bunch of Ron Burgundies enjoying their meal of steak, waffles, french fries, and scotch. So those kind of flavors. And that was a significant difference. So this is when we start getting into the German side of my personality, which is a little bit obsessive. Because now you start asking yourself questions, right? So you got some data, so what does it actually mean? And when you get to the beer style, so what are you going to do with those flavors? How are you going to reconcile those flavors to beer styles that are going to be something that people are willing to pay for? You have to start putting some facts into the equation, what styles are selling right now, and you guys know which ones those are, right? You know the ones that fly off the shelves and which ones take a little bit longer. Um, but why is that? How is that? Um, and these are questions you can ask. Um, what styles do you actually like to brew, right? It's a job, but like, don't ask me how much I love doing surgery every day, but at the end of the day, it, it, you need to do what you like, otherwise it's not gonna last, right? And the health of your company and the health of what you do depends on your enjoyment, right? People who don't like their job don't do well. So part of being a brewer is understanding you're a human being and not a robot, um, and you like to brew what you like to brew, and that's cool. Um, there's ways to sell that. Um, what styles are projected, so what styles are coming, and what's the growth plan, right? Like, where is your operation going? Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to have a massive Moosehead-style fact beer factory that makes lagers, which is great, and most of the Maritimes is super happy about that? Do you want to stay small and, and stick to a certain group of styles of beers? Again, you can look at those flavor profiles and start to see where that's going to fit into that, right? But at the end of the day, you need to be professional. And part of being a professional means being able to filter um, and have current information. So that means staying current. You can use social media. Her talk was awesome. I clearly need to seriously step up my Instagram game. Um, track sales. And one of the cool things is investigating your customer base. Um, if you look at my, my brewer partners, um, I'm sold out like two two years in advance, um, and a lot of that kind of um, buzz comes from investigating my customers. So I have a SurveyMonkey account, which costs me like next to nothing, um, and I survey beer drinkers and I survey brewers um, with, as you can see, with purpose. But people are like really like it when you ask them what they think, and you care enough to track it and study it and produce a paper and publish it. Um, and, um, you know, my, the, the uh, 25 breweries that helped me with that study um, all got a cop are going to get a copy of the paper, and that kind of creates a cool little thing. Um, I'm going to do uh, an, uh, a presentation for, the, for one of the breweries. They're having a little beer night. And I'm presenting the paper to a lot of the people who helped supply the data for the paper. So it kind of creates, you know what I mean? It's a good thing. Like it's, it doesn't take a whole bunch of time to make a crappy little survey. But at the end of the day, there's real important questions your brewery needs an answer to. It's a great way to get at that. Um, that doesn't take a ton of time. Be a member of trade organizations. Obviously, you guys are here. So talking with experts is important. Making friends is important. Um, all these sorts of things you already know. Um, but also engaging the scientific community is super important. Um, right now is actually a super critical time in brewing science. Uh, not going to get into what I think about the legalization of weed because it's not important. Um, Canada has embraced it. Um, New Brunswick has definitely embraced it. Um, but so has um, research dollars. The same people that study hops also get pe uh, pigeonholed in the weed. So we have a group of scientists in Canada that are really super smart and know a lot about hops. And guess what's going to happen if we don't engage them and support them? We're going to lose them. I spent the past year traveling around, talking to brewers, building up some steam to get some money into some funding to keep the people who need to study hops studying hops because they're going to go into weed. So just that's a word of caution. There's two guys, at least two guys, I see three or four of them that are crazy smart, know what they're talking about, and need to be engaged. 
Um, because our biggest risk in craft brewing is overconfidence. Um, and, uh, I'm, you know, anyway, science is a good way of grounding us and, and helping us uh, maintain the humility that we need. So flavors um, um, that are currently favored is important. Um, doing the styles that meet a, uh, remember, a criterion of rational deliberation. So I'm doing this style for this reason, understanding that reason, documenting the reason, and not being scared to market that reason. Maybe your favorite beer ever is a New England IPA, and as that style hopefully slowly comes out of favor, you can say, I'm still brewing it because I love this beer. It's important to me. I was mowing the lawn, and my six-year-old daughter told me something, and I had this cool moment, and it's named, I named it after her, and this is why I have this New England IPA. Or, you know what I mean? Whatever it happens to be. I'm just making that up. But the idea is just focusing on that and marketing it, and knowing why you're doing that beer is important. If you know why, share it with your customers so they know why, and that's important to them. Um, and knowing the flavors that you're trying to pick, knowing the flavors that you're trying to impart into the beer is more important than knowing the name of the hops that you're trying to put in the beer. There's a study that we're about to put out. You guys ready to be shocked? Knowing the flavors that you're after in the beer, knowing the flavor targets, so knowing that this beer needs to have these three flavors for it to be successful. Taking the best batch of that beer you ever had, taking a group of panel, right, a sensory panel, and saying these are the three things that are absolutely essential, they're part of the essence of this beer. This is what this beer is. If you take stone fruit out of this beer, it's not the same beer, right, versus some grainy sweetness. That's not essential to that beer. You know what I mean? Knowing what those are and having those as the target rather than the name of a hop written on a recipe card. The idea, the important thing behind that for people like me who obsess over flavor and do aroma analysis and all that stuff, for us, when I know a hop is where it should be, is the flavors that I smell. When I harvest it, how I harvest it, how I dry it, how long, all these sorts of things, all these different parts in the processing um, chain are all based on flavor and aroma analysis, which is legitimized by, um, in a lot of cases, um, GC analysis. An example of that is the uh, Hellas by Grimross, which is one of my primary brewing partners in Fredericton, New Brunswick. We spent, um, I do a lot of test brewing. Um, and we started with this beer three years ago. We isolated four main flavor targets. The essence of this beer are these four flavors. Without these four flavors, it's not. With them in the right relative concentration, you get the beer. In 2017, that meant I used one single hop through the whole process. 2018, I did a blend of three hops in a ratio that was determined by a test brewing program. This year, it's going to be two hops. It's hard to know, but our, our sensory panel, which included some, some customers, the reason why they continue to choose this beer, it is the same year over year. That when they get a Grimross Hellas, it tastes the same. When you get an Alpine from Moosehead, it tastes the same. When you get a Molson Canadian, it tastes the same. So what you're seeing is, as part of the evolution for Grimoros, is getting a beer, it doesn't matter if it's 2017 or 2019, the beer is the same. My job as a grower is, to, is the Grimoros blend, right, is not a set recipe. It's based on me knowing the hops, looking at the analysis, knowing what constituents are there, knowing what Grimross wants, and then blending them to get that. And if you actually look at the GC analysis from that blend year over year, it's pretty much the same. There's, um, so there's a lot there, um, but at the end of the day, the target is giving the drinkers what they want. This beer this year, they sold 20 barrels of beer in less than 14 days. And it's got our, this is our, our current logo on it. 
Um, we talked about the process. I was on the CBC once quickly um, talking about hops and blending and local environment and aroma and all that sort of stuff. And people get fired up about it and that's one way to do that. But the key, there's some key elements to that relationship, right? It's mutually beneficial. Um, you want how much for your cascade versus you want you want to pay how much for your locally produced cascade. I don't do cascade because these guys jerks um, produce it way better than I can. There's a lot of great stuff about the Maritimes. Our climate is not one of them. Um, but as it would turn out, to my favor, the German hops actually do quite great, which was nice because I can say spalt spalter, <laughs> which means I can charge an extra $2 a pound. No, I'm joking. Um, you have to have an unrelenting and public commitment to excellence. Note the public, right? The public thing is critically important. And that means being a brewer, going out of your comfort zone and entering into competitions where people might tell you that you don't piss excellence. The same way that when I submit my hops to be analyzed, like, just like, oh God, is it gonna be like it's supposed to be, you know? That, I mean, it's the same thing. You're waiting for this to come back, and for us, it's the maritime, so like, I know I gotta analyze Josh's hops, I know they're supposed to be a turnaround, but it's like Thursday, which is almost Friday, which is pretty much a holiday Monday, so. What are you doing over there, Mark? Jesus Christ! You know, next thing you know, it's two weeks later, and I'm still waiting for my analysis to come back, and I'm starting to take pills, you know, <laughs> for my stomach. Uh, anyway, and the idea of, of like a visible investment, right? Like Grimoros and I, like we're associated with one another, right? And we're associated in areas that's visible to everybody. So, like, when people go into Grimros in Fredericton or Loyola City in St. John or PEI Brewing Company in Charlottetown, like, my logo's there. Josh is part of all this sort of thing. People ask the hops. I know all the employees of both places. I give lectures on hops and biochemistry and brewing tips and all this sort of stuff. And the last one I did at PEI Brewing was on um, um, biochemistry and dry hopping. So everyone knows who I am, or, and I know who they are. And so it creates this visible public relationship. And, and, and that's something worth kind of, uh, in our mind, it's something worth fighting for. Maritimers are very, um, you know, we're all into the nepotism, right? We don't trust people from Upper Canada. We don't know what to do with people from BC. Uh, we like the prairie people because they're also super rural and don't give a crap about stuff. But part of it is like patience and understanding, right? It's not Burger King. You're not going to get it the way you want it. You don't pull up to the window and get the best hops ever, and I don't pull up to the window expecting the best beer ever, right? I'm a super massive beer, like beer nerd, I'm not a snob yet, but ever. Um, but the idea is like things take time, man. I remember the first time I had a, the, um, the Belgian uh, Saison from Grimross. It was not like not where I knew it could be. Guess what happened two years later? Poured me a Grimrock shovel door and it blew my mind, right? And that's a natural evolution of that brewery, right? That's, that's Stephen and Ian and the team figuring stuff out, figuring out how to get that equipment to do its thing. As we all know, yeast are as, as wrangleable as hot plants are. And the idea is with time, it became an amazing thing. It's an amazing beer. It's won awards at the CBAs and elsewhere. You know, and that patient, and he has the same patient and understanding with me because I can tell you right now, he's opened a bag of hops and got a nice little surprise once. At the end of the day, though, that's not like, hey, Josh, you're a piece of garbage and your hops are garbage. It's like, man, I drove up, we looked at the bag, figured out what was going on, sent it off for analysis. I know what the problem is. Guess what? It's never happened again. Did he dump me? No. Did I have I ever dumped him? No, I'm not going to. Um, and integrity is super important. I'm not going to rant on this because we all learned this from our grandmothers, but um, dishonesty is always a deal breaker. I don't remember seeing God flipping you the keys, so just keep your mouth shut. When things go great, feel free to talk. When things go bad, <laughs> shut it. Be professional. Have integrity. Deal with it individual to individual. And all that does is create a better and even closer work environment. The reason why... Uh, of, of the people that I work with, I'm really close with five of my five of my brewers. It's because we've been through good times and we've been through super, super shitty times. And that creates an awesome bond. 
And when people talk to us about that, about our experiences, about what we've done together, you can't hide that, right? You can't hide that, that relationship. That comes naturally to, to ex-army people, but this idea that, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood, like we're working together, we're doing something cool, we're on a path, you know, it's going to take some time, but when we get there, it's going to be so freaking awesome. And what, what did we learn this year that has brought us one step closer? We're not there yet. We're never going to be there probably. And I remember looking at my brewer, Mark McGraw from Loyalist, who is a insanely talented, very, very professional brewer. We just finished a beer, and that was the first question. I said, Mark, what do we got to do better? And we figured some things out. But at the end of the day, um, mistakes happen, mother nature happens, brewing and yeast happens, public opinions change, costs go up and costs go down, demand does the same thing. Other business partners happen, employees come and go, at the end of the day, learning happens. Because really, what we're doing is a generational pursuit, right? I decided, you know what, I am the stupidest human being on earth. I worked 17 years to be an, orth an orthopedic trauma foot and ankle surgeon, I'm not going to do that anymore. Before I decided to do this, my grandfather said to me, you want to grow hops? It will make you very poor. It will frustrate your children, but your grandchildren will be rich. <laughs> Last I checked, surgeons actually are currently rich, although I'm not that kind of surgeon. Um, if I wanted to be a, a stinker, and anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to miss it. This is, oh great, this is going to be on the internet. Anyway, um, but part of it too, and again, this is what Maritimers do great, okay? You want to know how this works? Watch me walk into a bar and hear another Cape Bretoner say, have a beer, please? <laughs> walk across the room. Where are you from? Nova Scotia? No, you're not. You're a caper. Where are you from? The Bay Bay. Wicked. I'm from the pier. The pier there. Right? Because there's that sense of camaraderie, right? There's shared experience. It's coming from a place that's not great, working your butt off and, and making something of yourself, right? Going down the road is the classic movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. You're not a Canadian until you have. Because if you're living in a building or riding on a road, it was probably built by a Cape Retner. Seriously. But part of it is the camaraderie, right? Being like, we're from the same place and that matters. And it doesn't just matter like, you know, they play the national anthem before a Canucks game, but it matters like when you're making decisions, when you're spending money, when you're forming business relationships and doing all those things. I pay someone a lot more than I need to because he is a guy from uh, a place in Cape Breton who's taken a chance who's done something stupid like I'm doing and creating a business with a young family and trying to make something of himself. I know I'm paying more. I've had the guy come down the road uh, from, from Siemens and tell me how much he could sell the almost exact same piece of equipment. I asked the guy from Cape Breton, why is this more? And he tells me, guess what? I'm totally fine with that because he's from Cape Breton and so am I. And like my six-year-old says, it makes my tattoo glow. And that's part of it, right? Part of what we're doing isn't just business, although business is a big, big, big part of it. End of story. And it, you know, if he was charging me three times more, I couldn't afford to pay that. I'm sorry. I know you're a Cape Bretoner too, but I can afford two times, not three, right? But there is there is this sense in the Mar in the Maritimes about we got to look after one another because if we don't, who's going to? The answer is not the dude from Toronto. And for the record, as it stands, the Boston Red Sox are still World Series champions, just so we're clear on that. But the idea is Canadian brewers working with Canadian farmers and Canadian processors brewing uniquely Canadian products for Canadians. This is who we are. A lot of people have fought and died for this, right? This is an amazing country, and we have a group of people doing an amazing thing, right? And uh, you'll see this kind of really poorly done Instagram photo. My nine-year-old took the picture. Really highlights the gray in my hair. Um, but you see here shoreline malting, right? So that's the northern PEI where I'm moving to. Um, 
and that's me doing test brew for Upstreet Brewing in Charlottetown, PEI. So I'm doing a, um, um, a four sample test using a combination of malt and hops to produce a uh, island, island lager beer that um, uses um, the best combination of hops. So they told, I said, I sat down with them, what do you want this beer to be? What do Islanders want? This is the, what's the best selling beer on PEI? It's not Budweiser. It's actually Coors Light. Seriously, it is. But, um, and here's what I want. Mike, or Hoagie, or Mike Hogan says, this is what I want in this beer. Okay, so I know right away, there's three hops that can get that done for me. Now I want to know how much citrus is too much and how much is not enough. So I dial in and out a hop, happens to be crystal in this case, which this year was exploding citrus. Um, and blend it into other hops, Hollow Tower, Middle Fru, and Zotzer, to achieve a very specific effect. I used, these guys just came out with a new um, Vienna malt, so um, dial that in and, uh, in and back. And um, we're going to decide which beer has, we're going to start by saying which one has the best hops, which one has the best malt, then I'm going to rebrew it. We're going to do it again. And then what happens is, after two or three sessions like this, is we come up with the Upstreet blend, right? And then guess who else is benefiting? John Webster, who's a really close friend of mine, who does shoreline malting, who has a young family. He's an MBA, crazy smart guy, who wants to maybe move back to PEI, right? And man, does PEI ever need that guy and his children there? You know what I mean? Like how amazing is that, to bring a guy that smart back to PEI and make sure he stays there? Um, and people told me at the start, I, I couldn't do this. They're always full of, you know what? And you know, Dach is German for bullshit. Because um, after seven years of all this research, we know what Canadian drinkers want. We know we can grow what they want. And now we're working on um, the research that says that we can generate the flavors that you need without a trademark logo anywhere. And we can, we can prove that we can give you market advantage. And we can also, I also can prove that I improve your customer loyalty. So I can prove to you that someone goes to um, a beer display and has the option to pick your beer versus a macro beer and chooses your beer. The bottom line is, this is a lot of work, but that's small business, right? Welcome to small business, this is how it is. Um, there's no easy road. Um, um, and um, at the end of the day, you wanna make uh, the Maritimes a better place to live. It's already the best place to live. BC's okay. <laughs> it's crazy beautiful here. Yeah, we can't compete. Sorry, it's all lies. You guys are awesome. You just, like, you're landing the plane and you see the mountains, you're just like, <laughs> We're never going to have the Olympics in Atlantic Canada ever. Uh, and I haven't even landed the plane yet, you know. The skiing could be great, doesn't matter. This is just gorgeous. So right now we're in the stages of transition. So seven years of a two-acre research farm is now being flipped into a 25 plus five acre farm in PEI. Um, so if you happen to be dumb enough to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, uh, you'll see that switching over the next little while. And I think it's time for a drinky poo. Thanks. Any questions? If we not, yeah. So the question was: Can you generate um, the profile of proprietary hops with um, public varieties? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, um, I, I've done that myself with the hops that I have. Um, Stan Hieronymus has uh, a couple of really well-published ones. The frustrating part with some of them is he uses other proprietary hops to, to mimic other proprietary hops, which is, which is interesting. Um, but that's because it was just such a dead ringer. It's not Stan's fault. But at the end of the day, um, absolutely yes. Um, the, um, the sort of mosaic Simcoe combination is also something that can be replicated for sure. Um, there are some combinations, are some hops that require brewing techniques in addition to the blend. And so um, that, that's where s some of my research is now aimed at, is looking at how brewing techniques can help with that. 
for what? Oh, so the Mosaic Simcoe combination is actually really difficult to replicate with public varieties. Um, and it's, it's the, um, that onion garlic that's there that you don't want that's there in a small, actually people do want it. They want it in a small amount. So if you ever have um, a, um, a dry hop uh, or uh, you skip the dry hop and use it in a late, so you, you blow off a lot of the onion garlic and it's not there at all, I'm sure you've all that experience, people miss it. If you look at that flavor, it's part of the dankness, right? It's part of that lower end, um, and that's important to have. The problem is with a public variety like Chinook, say, is a classic example, has a ton of onion and garlic in it too, um, but it does not have the high end. So blending in other hops that have the high end without the lower end, often you're, you're mixing families. So Crystal is a great example where you can get, it'll contribute citrus but little else, okay? Especially if you're using it in the dry hop, right? So um, there's different ways, to, different ways to tackle that. And unfortunately, the only way to do that is experience. Um, I 100% think that over the next five years, you're going to start seeing people publishing how to do that and giving people a starting point. So what I want to do is publish a table and say, here's five proprietary hops. Here's your starting point. You can start with these hops and try to get there. Right? Because I can't say, because again, a um, uh, classic example is um, uh, the, the blend this year with uh, a big axe as a brewery uh, outside of Fredericton, and they have, it's called their uh, Hop and Sickle. Um, this year, our uh, Super Alpha, uh, last year, our Super Alpha was so strongly apricot that as it was drying, my six-year-old was in the, in the pool, and he, he's, he's like, where are the apricots? Is there apricots around? Like, it was so strong, it was almost overpowering. Um, and I had to add crystal to get the citrus in there that they wanted, because they told me they wanted stone fruit and citrus, and that was it. They don't want any other flavors, which is challenging, but um, did it. This year, the Super Alpha had both. So rather than a three to one of super alpha, or sorry, a three to two of super alpha crystal, it's a three to one or three to 0.5 this year, right? And so that's why you can say, oh, here's a recipe to, to, to uh, replicate this proprietary variety. It's gonna change every year, right? So you just gotta have a starting point to say, here's three hops you can substitute this with in a blend that you have to figure out, which is annoying, which is why proprietary hops are so great, right? That's why they make so many people so much money. But at the same time, when you spend five years of your life becoming a sister owner and doing all this sensory analysis, it's kind of cool that you can pull it off. But at the same time, making it practical for everyone's hard. And that's the reality, right? I wish it wasn't, but it is. Because, I mean, that's a super amazing combination of hops. It is. End of story. It tastes great. Yep. Yep. Are Canadian hop growers really poised to jump on the product right when they expire? So that's not, uh, so the question was is going to expire in 20 uh, very shortly. Um, and are Canadian hop growers positioned to take that over? The short answer is no. It's much more complicated than that. Let's say I wanted to grow Mandarina Bavaria, public variety, right? It's a public, it's not owned by anybody. Practically getting access to the, that, that germplasm, the rhizomes, is really, really not easy. Harrisbrook is another one. I've spent, me and Agriculture Canada, I've spent a lot of effort trying to get some Harrisbrook over here, and it's not straightforward. Um, there's a lot of very important laws that prevent the transport of plant material because we don't want to get German diseases in Canada, and Germans don't want Canadian diseases there. So it's not that straightforward. The hope is yes, though, because Amarillo is awesome. Yep. Well, yep. So if you were, so if you were a hop grower and starting now, planting more, sure. So you're here in BC. Yeah. So, um, so just 
as an as a side rant. Um, I did when I started. I, I thought I was going to do sea hops right in Atlanta, Canada, and I grew all of them, and then triangulated each one of them over a couple of years with hops from BC, yeah, and Yakima. And uh, <laughs> so you've got three. I was noticing across them, there was one that was finishing super crappy all the way across. And I was like, those are mine, aren't they? <laughs> yes. So the PDO analysis was great. The plants were producing over two pounds dry per plant. They looked awesome. It's just the terroir in Atlantic Canada does not favor that, right? Um, and that's not Atlantic Canada. That's just where I grow. I did the same for the continental European hops, and they are they're great. And in some cases, uh, independent assessors are saying they're superior to plants from the Hollertau in Germany. So great. So if you're growing hops in BC, part of what you need to understand is which hops you grow well, which hops compare favorably to the targets that you're after, which hops do you already have, which flavors can you already provide to brewers, and can you provide them in the mounds that are needed. Why would I grow so much flipping crystal, right? That's a crappy hop. Like who's 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 like fighting over a bag of crystal? The answer is no one. But and all of my blends, guess what women want in their beer? They want, they want citrus. So every single blend that I do for every single brewery needs citrus. Crystal is really good in my region at providing a little smack of citrus and virtually nothing else. Because remember, I'm hiding the crystal with other noble hops. So there's nothing a whole lot different between crystal and holotone. So the only relative difference between those hops is the addition of the citrus from the crystal, right? I'm in BC. Maybe crystal doesn't grow as well. Maybe crystal makes something else. Maybe the, the flavor thing that I'm deficient in is this or that, and finding that hop is important. I know it's a super vague, annoying answer, but it honestly is the way hop growing is going, right? And if you're looking at, say, like, let's just say you have all the sea hops, there's a couple of hops coming out. Triumph is one that people are excited about. Um, Comet, Tahoma. Um, those hops have a lot of uh, uh, traction. Like people want them. They have the smell that people are after currently. Um, but remember, people are after them now. So you're not going to get the Comet, um, Triumph, Tahoma for three years. What are your thoughts on Sterling? Um, Sterling is a, yeah, can be a great hop, yeah. I don't have a ton of, I don't grow sterling, and it's not uh, really on my list. I have other hops that I'm growing that produce at really great amounts with reasonable disease resistance that overlap with sterling. So as a con contributor to flavor, I'm not really like, you know what I mean? I don't need it. Um, but it's all, I know from others who do grow it, it's a great hop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So biotransformation, daddy lucky. As if, as if being a brewer wasn't hard enough. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, this is why I think as, a, as two groups, brewers and farmers should be like, you know, Linus and, and uh, Charlie Brown, right? Just have the same view of the world because you're just getting your ass kicked by stuff you can't control all the time. And at, at the time when you least want it or need it is when it always happens. Um, biotransformation is like something that, you know, obviously we have heard this before. The guys from Sapporo figured it out. Um, and uh, citronellol was generated from gerinol. And gerinol really is a special chemical for several reasons. It's very, very, um, um, like you pick up on it in very small concentrations. Um, and it's very pleasant in and of itself, but also gets translated into a bunch of different things. It really depends on the yeast. And so this is where, um, honestly, people say to me, like, why do I, like, why as a hop grower am I brewing so much? It's because if I'm going to tell a brewer what's going to be in your beer, I don't know what's going to be in your beer until I use the yeast that you've used and the hops that I have. And at the end of the day, say, this is what's present. I think um, it's one. I think it's one of those things that is going to become increasingly a huge part of um, what we consider. And so this is why when people say to me, "Okay, 
um, I want you to do this blend for me. It's not as simple as me just coming up with a blend that says, okay, this is where I think it's at. It's also putting and say, what yeast are you using, using that exact yeast under reasonable temp uh, conditions. And then saying, you know, I used your uh, Vermont Ale strain and here we are. I use Bravo with tons of Jerry and all in it and man, this thing just goes boom. So um, it, it for sure comes down to the hop varietal and that that's providing the building blocks for the yeast to do what they do. And um, that's why I had the picture of the building blocks. I skipped over biotransformation because I rant and I didn't want it to go too long. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's, and, and then the yeast strain obviously is critically important. That's being studied more and more and there's a lot, um, I think there's a lot more to come on that. But as a brewer, you know, or for me as a grower, Researching that on an N of 1 basis is really important, right? Um, I learned that the hard way because I, I sold a bunch of hops to this brewery and, and man, like the hop tea was great. Everything we wanted was there. Brewed it. Like, what the fuck? What happened? This beer's flat. Super flat. Um, and that, this is a super professional brewer. She's been in the business for 26, 27 years. And um, the problem was, it was definitely biotransformation. Things are being changed, and the high end was gone, and all we were getting was that low end. Like the, res the supporting resinous um, onion, garlic, all the stuff that you need to support the high end and a hoppy APA, IPA beer, the high end was gone. So we realized, man, this ton of biotransformation. Next batch, 10% final gravity. That's when we added it. Boom, we got it. So. Um, the next step was, how can I change the, because obviously when you're dry hopping that late, there's other stuff you're missing, right? That becomes a bit of a high-low beer as opposed to like a balanced beer. So then we went back, re-blended re the hops, I added another hop, um, and then it made it through the process to give that all, the aroma at all three levels, the high, mid, and low. Um, and that's what the process is like, right? So now we know what yeast we're going to use. She's going to use the Vermont Ale yeast from, from White Labs. And this is the hops that we're using. And it creates a lot of um, um, consistency in the product. Yeah. So you can do that. Um, there's a book by um, Scott Janish. It's called uh, New IP or whatever. Um, that has a really great, I mean, it's a great book. The new IPA, Scott Janish. Um, that's like, it's like, uh, it's super great, but at the same time, you're like, mother, it's like five years of my life reading all these papers and scratching them together, and this dude puts together this awesome book. And I have, I have a brewer who, who's just super into the, like, super new in the business, like, schooling me on this stuff. I'm like, what the hell? That is a super obscure paper. How did you know about that? She's like, oh, I got this book. And I read it, and I was like, this is awesome. Everyone should read that book. Everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a hop grower, brewer, maltster. It doesn't matter. It is an amazing book. And he's also a super nice guy. Has a great Instagram feed um, where he, like, posts little rants. Um, and they're awesome rants. They're really informative. And, yeah, and he's just an all-around just super nice person. So, yeah, I'd highly recommend that book to everybody. Yep. So high end being like, um, so the, the, the aromas I'm talking about, so stone fruit, citrus, berry, the, the finer kind of fruity aroma that you're after, the oxidized aroma. So that oxidized aroma is coming from your oxygenated hydrocarbons, and that, those are the ones that are producing all those, those flavors, the more delicate ones. The low end flavors tend to be the non-oxidized uh, monoterpenes, so myrosine, humulene, all those, that give you that hoppy flavor that people still really, really like. The mid flavors would be kettle flavor, so if you're like a noble hop farmer like I am, the ones that oxygenate through the boil process, right, which is why Germans boil for 90 minutes, right, to get those oxygenated hydrocarbons that make the beer super woody and snappy, very refreshing and make you want to drink more, right? So that's what I mean by those three levels. That, that's just my totally arbitrary, that's not based on any study, right? that's just my own little thing of trying to think about the different aroma things I'm after so I don't forget stuff or be stupid. 
Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody.